hidden life vibrant in every atom. O hidden light shining in every creature. O hidden love embracing all in oneness. May each who feels himself as one with thee know is also one with every other. Be seated. Brothers and sisters, I am very happy to welcome you for today's session, namely the Wisdom for Living series lecture number eight today. And uh, this is an initiative of the Theosophical Society, Adyar, and featuring the speakers across the spectrum of human activity, namely business, arts, fitness, ecology, science, spirituality, and who have found ways to apply spiritual principles to their work and living. You all know, most of you, the motto of the Theosophical Society and also its objectives. So I am to tell you that we are members of this great organization, the Theosophical Society, which proclaims Theosophy, the divine wisdom, to the entire world, irrespective of race, creed, caste, color, or gender. So it should be clearly understood that we intend to kindle the spirit of universal brotherhood in each and every person in the world and Theosophical, theosophy and universal brotherhood are synonymous, inseparable. No other institution, I am to say that in this world, has spread this message of universal brotherhood in such a big way among masses. We owe this success to our great founder, Madam H. V. Blavatsky, as a Russian lady, and we owe and pay homage for her contribution to the world through her occult power. She has done service to the world. And to our co-founder, Colonel Henry Steele Alcott, he was a great organizer. And he established the Theosophical Society. And I am to tell you that he was a great agricultural scientist and he had a very deep involvement and also showed much interest in research and development of all the activities connected with agriculture. And our founders have rightly chosen this paradise, Adyar, as our international headquarters with water boundaries of river and sea, with strip of golden sand on one side, and broad roads on the other side, with outer frame of coloring sky, with beautiful green vegetations of banyan, coconut, mango, tamarind, other fruit-bearing trees, with flowering plants and shrubs, the birds singing and flying, animals and reptiles moving, which have made Adyar their home. This atmosphere instills one the feeling of brotherhood of all that lives, unity of all life. So I am very eager to tell you that this year is the 175th year of uh, birth anniversary of Dr. Annie Besant, our second international president. Dr. Annie Besant had several sterling qualities, and these qualities led her to the number of areas of service. She was a diamond soul 
with multifaceted services to humanity. She was a great educationist, author, orator, religionist, philosopher, par excellence, and social reformer, and strove for child development and women's upliftment, occultist, great teacher, theosophist, and she was follower of truth. And her role in Indian politics and freedom movement, you all know very well. And Madam H. V. Blavatsky, our founder, gave us theosophy, the divine wisdom. And Colonel Alcott, the co-founder of the Theosophical Society and founder president of the Theosophical Society, gave us this Theosophical Society, the organization. And Dr. Annie Besant gave us the Theosophical Order of Service with beautiful motto, a union of all who love in the service of all who suffers. So Dr. Besant at one stretch wanted to bring majority of people into the Theosophical fold who can willingly come forward to alleviate the suffering of others with love and compassion. So, and she, she threw herself into society's work and to make theosophy practical. So, thus principal aim of the theosophical work is to uplift the humanity by bringing fundamental change in human, that is human regeneration and forward the evolution and to safeguard the civilization. And today we have the pleasure of having Sister Archana Stalin with us to talk on the subject, you are what you eat. She is green champion, social entrepreneur, travel enthusiast, and uh, she is a woman achiever, and uh, she is the founder and growth champion of the My Harvest Farms. And uh, in the year 2018, Archana and her husband started organic farming in the name of the My Harvest Farms. Archana studied B engineering course, computer science from Gindi Engineering College, maybe Anna University. After completing the studies, she got a job in Tata Consultancy Service. And uh, you all know TCS, which is one of the best multinational software company. But she left the job. The reason began that uh, she had taken the decision uh, to become an entrepreneur and so she planned to start a business in relation to her work and she visited a uh, lot of rural areas and her objective is creating a change in the society. In the initial stage when Archana Stalin and her, her husband started the business there were only uh, three or four farmers with them. But today, they have about 160 farmers across Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. So she says that I believe I was born in this world to bring about a change in the little way I can. And today, with my startup called My Harvest, I am striving to connect with people closer to nature, help them enjoy safe and healthy food, and let more people experience natural farming. Over the years, I have followed my passion, shattered few barriers, and tried my hands at all things that interested me. As an entrepreneur, I learned business and life lessons more from people than books very good experience, and trust and laid the path to journey of my impacting rural people. And BUDS is an 
it's actually the words which is be united, do service. Be united and do service. She draws inspiration from people like Mother Teresa, Bunker Roy, Ilango and Joe Madiat for showing me that a single person can make a difference. Meeting people makes her happy because it gives her new opportunities to learn new things and we too are very happy to have her among us to share our wisdom on such an important subject. We are what we eat. Sister Arjuna. Good evening, everybody, and thanks, ma'am. I think you've done a detailed research about me and very beautifully done, uh, to the point. Uh, especially good evening to everyone here. Uh, so the topic comes from, actually, you must have heard nutritionists say we are what we eat, and a lot of people keep saying that. But I wanted to add a farmer's perspective to that today. So uh, seven, eight years ago, when I moved from the city to do farming, I had no clue of a lot of things. OK, so for me, a lot of things were exciting. And uh, I was wondering why I never learned this when I was in school. And I also thought when I scored a sentiment in biology, I knew a lot of things. But really, I didn't know why I was even eating a carrot. So I was also very disconnected to the food I was eating. And today, I think we need to change a lot of consumerism if we have to also impact the farming sector. So every meal choice that we make can actually impact the livelihood of a farmer. So and that's exactly why we have this conversation today. And thanks, Ram Kumar, sir, for bringing this up. Uh, so going to the topic, I start with a small little story. Probably, next, next. Probably everybody looking at this will remember our childhood days, right? So going to school or some way on the way, we always looking at this, whatever be the age, we would have touched the plants and then felt happy. For me, uh, four years ago, before COVID, I had a farm visit from a school. Okay, So we had children from fourth grade, fifth and sixth grade come to our farm. In fact, I was teaching them all gardening at their school. They had given me a space. We were learning how to grow food at the campus. But then this was very remarkable because they came to the farm and some of them for the first time were seeing touch me nots. They are eight, eight year old, nine year olds who have not even seen them. And the next class I go to teach, they ask me, why don't you bring me seeds of touch me not? Let's plant them. <coughs> Today's children are so very disconnected. It's kind, for a second, if you just, if that sinks in, I think a lot of them have very little exposure besides their homes or besides their closed doors or their gadgets. So. There is an increasing need for us to bring more children to places like Theosophical Society and a lot more places with greenery so that they can appreciate the nature around us. And for me, I quit my job six, I mean, 2016 was my last job, seven years ago, right? So I quit my job to get back to farming after my small stint with terrace gardening. So the whole joy started with having a small garden at home, eating fresh greens, trying out growing different vegetables and killing some plants and also so I didn't have a green thumb in the first attempt. But a lot of experiences convinced that, at least for my family, I should start eating good food. And, they, uh, and that's how I don't own farmland. So again, a first generation entrepreneur in terms of business, in terms of farming, there were a few generations in between did not stick to farming. In fact, my father sold the farmland to buy a house in Chennai. So we are one of the same victims of people who have lost farmlands. So next, next. So today, this venture is a result of, I, I would say, about 13 years of my learnings put together into one thing. So I think I found a purpose. And I've structured it into a venture called My Harvest Farms. OK, so back in college, I studied very close by. I studied in engin engineering college, Anna University, another green sprawling campus. Uh, I started an NGO then during college. And uh, the NSS is something we used to have in college. Most of us know. So I was diligently going to all my NSS camps, even till the final year. And when we went there, I saw families in the villages growing jasmine, excessive chemical usage, just for flowers. We don't even eat them. But people had to spray a lot of harmful pesticides to grow jasmine. And we used to do all these surveys. I saw people complain about a lot of skin diseases, but never connected the, so like Steve Jobs says, I didn't connect the dots then. But later, when I went back to the village after doing this terrace gardening, I thought, so nice to grow vegetables, eat them healthy, and why are farmers suffering? Why can't they also grow something for themselves? Why are they suffering? So I had some nice ideas about natural farming, reading all of this. 
And then I traveled across the country. That was what she is talking about. In 2014, uh, I had a chance. I don't know if you have heard about Jagrati Yatra in India. It's more like a train journey, moving to see different rural parts of the country and meet social leaders. So I was curiously on the train in 2014. Uh, I went to places like Rajasthan, uh, Orissa, Bihar, and all of that. So I met leaders who were not really politicians, who were not with great power, but they had radically changed the lives of people. So Joe Mariat is one person I met in Orissa. He's actually from Kerala. But he went there, and for 33 years, in that particular village in Ganjam, close by Ganjam, he actually is helping people build toilets, work solar. He's changed their lives and made them more susta sustainable. So I was inspired by all of that in 2014 and came back. And then I didn't know what I wanted to do. So there was such inside me, and I started at Terrace Garden. I was doing composting at home, slowly moved towards a minimalistic lifestyle and all of that. So the search was there on and on and on. When my farming happened, I was just so hard because I quit my jobs. Both me and my husband, both of us quit our jobs. To make 10,000 rupees was difficult a month. But we were toiling hard. We were still working. But the money of selling it to the people, convincing them, and then the logistics, everything was very difficult. So we understood the life of challenges of a farmer. Here in the city, I remember us going to an organic shop, or we always doubting whether it's really organic. And having a terrace garden and just to have one tomato, it took so much effort. That white bug was a big irritation. So both of this, I found that there was an opportunity. Because people in the city wanted to have a terrace garden, but we didn't have the time. We didn't have the know-how. And some of us didn't have the space as well. There was all of these limitations. But when I was doing farming, I saw we had all of them. We had, there was plenty of land, plenty of know-how, people doing farming for generations. And there was also time for them, but they lacked viability. So try to connect both their problems together. And the approach was to build a community-based initiative and make sure the farmer knows the consumer and the consumer knows the farmer. Because there was traceability is a problem. Trust is a problem. So that's what we do. Today, I deliver fruits, vegetables from our farmers to families here. So we help farmers grow, and we also bring it to the consumers. And there are a lot of interactions that happen. So this, so what I do is today farm to home, but I'm not, not going to talk about business today, but just giving you a context of why I'm talking what I'm doing. Next. So overall, today we have a network of 200 plus farmers, uh, about seven to eight districts. Uh, so my closest, actually the spinach and the greens come from uh, Tiruvallu district, which is like 40 kilometers. Uh, we have carrots coming from Uti. So most of it is from the geo uh, climate conditions, geography, all of that included but promoting local varieties. So we are more particular and uh, about non-GMO and all of that, but more particular about fresh, local, and seasonal. So even I know apples are there in everybody's house all the time. I don't sell apples around the year, right? We have apples during those four or five months in a year when you actually have the season there in Shimla, and we can bring it here. So my apples are five days old maximum. If you go Google it out, you might find apples are generally eight to nine months old, generally what is sold outside. So we tried to bring in as fresh, and the process that we do is mostly traditional farming. So we know what we give to the soil. So I'll talk about it during the presentation, but I'm saying I've not innovated much on farming. I'm not like going to say IoT technology and all of that. We've just gotten people back to their roots, back to the belief that nature is still working. We have done some harm, but nature is still the power is what I will be reiterating again. So next. And uh, all our farmers, we have moved them from a monocropping to a multi-cropping model. So the food we eat also has this problem, right? It travels a longer distance today. And uh, farmers, why are they struggling? We often say there's no rain, they're not able to sell and all of that. But many of the farmers' problems is also that all the risk is with the farmer. If you look at the paddy, do you know how long does it take for paddy to harvest? From sowing till the harvest, how many months or years or days? Three months, right? So most of the farmers today grow two seasons. Some of the best farmers with best land maybe do three bo uh, right? Two seasons is what they generally do. And if you look at it from sowing till the harvest and the fourth month after harvest, they have to sell and make money. So the money rotation to their hands is only twice in a year. The rest of the year, there is hardly anything flow of money at all. And if there is a rain in between, gone. 
and if they are not able to mill it again it's gone so there are a lot of unpredictable variables plus risk here so we said why don't you also do monocropping so multi cropping where they can do a mix of greens and vegetables so there is some harvest happening every week plus integrated farming where you can also have some poultry you can also have uh something else like livestock for milk and all of that so that the integrated farm will help us do a circular economy model like the waste of the hens will still be many of the land the all of that is circular so today our farmers do like a food forest or they do multi cropping so that's one thing where we are also promoting native varieties of trees bringing back the green cover in the farms that we work with next so that's my life map it's very very confusing so i people ask me did you study agriculture no so i don't know what i'm doing why i'm doing all of that but i'm sure everything will fall in place just doing whatever one life follow and keep doing and I, today i look back i think there was a connection in the last 13 years of whatever i was doing why i was traveling and all that today i don't may not have an answer why i'm meeting you all but definitely if i look back i'm sure today we're going to have some great conversations and learn from each other next but what first convinced me so people ask why did you leave your job and to farming and why are you talking about good health and all of that uh so health i think everybody can agree all of our health undergoes a toil sometime or the other so every one in two women have anemia and i i was also anemic so health is definitely an answer but convinced that natural farming works after uh this is in virudhanagar the previous picture previous picture one previous this is actually a pond which didn't look like a pond at all so uh, this is my my in-laws place when i went there we were just walking and my father in law told me that this used to be a pond okay used to be and he said 20 30 years back we used to uh, we, was the last time i saw water here as a child he came here for swimming and all of that but we have never seen water here in the last 20 years is what he told us and then we asked whether is there a possibility to do something he said yeah if we can just remove all of these th so much of these thorny bushes around if we can remove them rain if it rains there will be some water can we try it and all and then i asked how much would it cost he said some 15000 20000 maybe and all of that so as a small little challenge me and my husband said we'll raise some money from friends we've got some pocket money and all of that as and when we got money we'd use the jcb to remove these bushes in just that one pond okay so next so we started this work next okay so this is after 9 days of work just 9 days of work and we were able to clear all of this it is about 1.8 acres i think this pond was and uh, uh, there are so many virudhanagar is very very dry first of all <laughs> people in tamil nadu this is one of the second driest uh, place in terms of rains or heat so this looked like a pond and we forgot about it so at least we had the satisfaction that we were able to clear the thorny bushes because their roots are supposed to take up water and drain the area so we felt there was something good happen and we left it next is what was surprising so this is the scene of the same space after about a month so we got a call from a very old man in the night saying after this rain i just walked that side and it was a wonderful sight so much of water and this water stayed there for at least 3 months it was there so in virudhanagar such a place if water management or something could happen and 9 days of effort 3 months of water and for a very water deficit because when i moved from chennai to virudhanagar we got those lorries once in a week and for 21 days we had to sometimes stock water if the lorries didn't come even in 20 2013 i'm talking about okay so for me this was just nature is bountiful nature can give us a lot but we're not managing our resources as well was one learning so when we started farming we also wanted to work on some water management in the villages that we were working on next talking about the food so this is my convincing that nature is still working and for me about food uh we have this notion that apples are good but when local goas are also rich in iron we don't give, give them the same importance so i started growing greens at home so i was anemic and all, every time the doctor said why don't you eat a lot of greens i said my mom cooks greens four five times in a week i keep eating greens but still i was so then we started growing and it was all very basic some of these seeds are available in the kitchen already like methi and all very easy to grow 
I, I bought, just bought some main plants, took off the leaves and started growing them at home. Some of them were easy to grow and including these greens brought in changes in our diet. So the health changes, from, at least for my father-in-law, we were able to see his diabetes reverse in two years. He was doing yoga, I wouldn't say only this food, but he had this discipline, but the food ingredients when we had to change did impact our health uh, in a positive way. So we were thinking how more can we utilize. So my terrace was having a lot of plants. All the open spaces we were having plants. So from greens, we then moved to having ladies' fingers at home. Then seeing some tomatoes. So if uh, there was a chutney at home, the four tomatoes we needed just came from my kitchen. That's all. We were, not, we were still buying, but at least a lot of the basic needs we had, we used to get all green chilies from my house. So some of these vegetables we tried to get only from my house and we were liking the difference in taste and all of that. And we tried helping friends also do terrace gardening. Okay, so eating the fresh, so when food is not traveling a longer distance, obviously sometimes there is not enough problems with it. Only when food has to travel a longer distance from where it is produced to where it is finally consumed, we have to do something for keeping it fresh during the path or looking fresh till it reaches the consumer or not perishing at all. Like I have so much challenges doing natural ripening of mangoes at this point in time. But for people who are just doing the other methods, they have to just fume it and fum do fumigation at one, one day and in two days everything is yellow. But for us we have to wait so patiently and there's a lot of wastage during the process. So growing food, the food should be closest to you. And the choices, I think, Eating them in the seasonal pattern also helps. Sometimes we have to eat a lot of these goats, pumpkins, all these water-rich vegetables. We need to include a lot of them. So knowing what food, and then when we buy earlier, I don't think, I'm not going to complain refrigerators are bad, but earlier our choices of cooking also used to be like we go buy a bunch and come, and depending on what gets spoiled first, we'll make our menu. Potatoes used to be the last one we cook, but today, the menu in the house is also like, randomly we want cauliflowers, randomly we want something, and the whole system has changed. So my idea is everybody should at least start growing greens and some herbs at home. Greens, the fresher, fresher you eat, the more nutrition you're able to get it. So uh, how many of you are already having some plants at home which you are edible, which you're eating? One. Good show of hands. Good. Okay. So... I think you will all relate to what I'm talking about, right? So the freshness, just while you cook, you go pull some curry leaves and use it and you're able to see that aroma difference, right? So you should also have some herbs in your house which you can quickly use for as a first medicine point. These are my first experiments. First later radish, first brinjals, next. And so this is the experiment I talked about when we were doing in schools. In, at schools, today, the, what was what I felt missing was when I quit job and started farming. Uh, there was a big gap in KT. Like when I quit job at ECS, they asked me to do a knowledge transfer before I moved on, so that the next person could take up that role. But here, all the knowledge was still lying with the older generation and not passed on. One, the people were saying, "You just study, leave the village, and at least find a better job." Okay, the next generation was not encouraged to be in farming. And the people who were there also today, if you go, I think the other one is doing farming, so yes, you will agree. People below 40, a lot of them don't know farming there. Even in the rural places, that's the case. So for them, uh, at least you escape this. And some of the farmers that I work with, like it, at my harvest also, uh, I'm happy at one point where most of my farmers are younger guys. 26 to 35 is the average uh, farmer age, at least in the district that I'm working. So some of them have a history of working outside, okay? So a friend of mine came from Mumbai and she wanted to meet my team. So when she met and asked, why are you doing farming? This is what two of them said. One of them was like, I'll be the king in my own space. Rather than me driving to 40 kilometers to a factory, he used to work at Yamaha. So a lot of warehouses, a lot of these retail have come. So he used to work at Yamaha. He said, I used to drive 40 kilometers there, punch my card and fight for my attendance and then lose my sleep in the morning, then come back. And it was very stressful for me. And I earned 15,000 rupees. What if I could just get the same or even 12,000 rupees in my own land at my own thing and my health will also be better. So he used to wake up early also is fine for me. I'll wake up, do all the job in the morning. I know to drive a tractor. I can be, learn whatever I want, but 
there are challenges i know but if i can make the same 15000 in my village why should i have to move and do that so that was his point of view second there was another person called ramesh is actually a resident farmer so for him when this person asked why are you with my harvest farms she's he's like earlier i used to uh, to me and he and his wife used to work they are they are the ones doing farming so he said earlier every day after farming i evening i go to the task mark and then i get back home so it's been like i have to take something in so that i don't have these itching problems in the night and i would have irritation during sleep today i have a better sleep i never knew this was a benefit we had given I mean, we had uh, offered the opportunity for I, I ne- this never was in my conversations before but i felt very different so he said nowadays i do, i'm a social drinker but it's not, i can't say i given up alcoholism but it was a necessity for me earlier because of the chemicals and i today live a, have a better sleep and all of these farmers are also eating what they grow strangely i don't know if you have this conversations most people who use these chemicals even when they grow all these they don't eat what they have grown i used to wonder when amir khan did this show before all these farmers that came on his show they used to have one separate portion where they grew vegetables for their families as a college kid or a school kid i never understood then but today they openly say i know what i put to the soil when i buy from the shop i don't know what is in it i'm fine right so even to grow tulsi even to grow anything today the norm is that they've gotten used to all of these bottles 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 that we've lo- forgotten how to grow the conventional or the traditional way so that's the biggest problem with production and if you tell them for the farmer they are okay to do both they are actually okay to do organic farming they are okay to do whatever farming as long as it sells as long as it sells they are okay to change they're not adamant that i will only do this the lot of thing is also with consumerism right the food we eat uh, all of us here i'm think thinking are very empathetic so you go to a shop you will not like pick only the beautiful ones right when i went to velmurgan anas farm uh, before i started my harvest farms he actually dumped some 18 kgs of brinjals on his farm they're all looking nice to me so i asked him why he said no i took them to the market and these were all rejected I said, why don't you take it back home? He's like, my wife is tired of eating brindles every day. So today she's going to shout at me, so I've just dumped it here. Why did he dump it? Because it was not purple, as purple as should be, right? The looks of it and the size of it also. Some of them had slight black dots, but if you definitely cut it, it's not, it may not be the same inside, okay? And this is not even natural farming. This guy is he's a cat on the wall types. A little of chemicals, but he wants to go organic kind of life. So there is so much of wastage in the system today also because of consumerism and there are choices. So all of this today is what I would want you to think through when you next time make your choice of foods. Is it local? Where does this come from? So I remember my father saying all the LNEs from Polachi will be tasty. Today we don't hardly know where they come from, <laughs> right? So my mother crazily he's now gone to my native. I'm sure two days after when she comes she's going to bring one bag of lot of vegetables including drumsticks curry leaves they're free in the shop but she'll bring it all the way from teni she's gone to my native so every time she goes up and come she'll bring vegetables so food has been an integral part but very sadly a lot of the food we eat is heavily heavily laced with chemicals and it is possible to do natural farming it's difficult i agree it's difficult but it's possible to do the air is already polluted the water is already polluted so i'm not going to say certified organic and claim all of this which is totally impossible but natural farming the way we grow our food is definitely possible and whatever we we give to the soil is what we are eating so if i'm going to be giving things that i know are not what i'll put into my mouth then the problem is very clear there itself so today our farmers we tell them how to choose their seeds and everybody makes their own farm inputs so the way we grow itself is difficult i'll just go through that please next so these are some of the experiments with school children now these kids talk pirandai they know manathakali so even this uh, nilavembu which is wh- which was quite popular during covid so the kids they used to play among themselves saying this is tulsi and they will give nilavembu to the boys and ask them to eat and they'll tease so we brought all of this in a very casual way into the children's conversations so we wanted conversations around food to first happen 
So that was a lot with school education. So this is the possibility part next. So this is our first farm and we were growing watermelons. The what growing in the back of backside is watermelons. And when we were doing, we were the only natural farmers there, okay? This is in a village called Bengal in Tirvalur. Uh, the crows would come and eat up our watermelons, okay? And uh, when we had rats, we didn't know what to do. So what I know my biology book said, snakes will eat rats, but there were no snakes. I can't bring a cat and say, go kill my rats because they'll also damage my watermelon. So every, all these were very random problems we had to face. But if you look at it, the crows didn't eat all of my watermelons. They had like three or four watermelons overall. Just to kill, uh, kill these, I mean, just to avoid four watermelons loss, imagine me spraying chemicals there. That's what most people are doing. And I want to understand from you, do you think pests are good or bad? We always say pest management is difficult. How do you do it in organic farming? Are pests or these insects good or bad? Good. good. Yes, How many of you say good? Because I'm asking, if some of you are, how many of you think it's bad? There has to be a balance. Yeah, actually, uh, like how we have a mix of good and bad people, if we are in intention to kill the pests or things around the world, we cannot win the race because the species of human beings is like one is to 20,000 or so. We have a biochemist here in the room, somebody can prove this number. So for every one human being, we actually more than, we have more than 20,000 other species there. At least pest itself, I had this number. So if I'm going to spray, some of them who are in the flying stage may get killed. But what about the larva? What about the eggs that's already there inside some leaf? Right? So we just, we are winning, we are doing something to win a race which we never can win. And that's the problem there. And if you look at pests, I'm not going to talk any chemical name during the presentation and I'm not going to even tell you the names of the insects. Again, that's a very, very wild race. But Generally, there are two kinds of pests, okay? Uh, good people, bad people, we have veg pest and non-veg pest. You th tell me who is good, vegetable pest, uh, vegetarian pests or non-vegetarian pests? For us, for human beings, who are the best ones? Non-vegetarian? I can't hear you, all of you are so silent. Little louder. No, I hear some non-vegetarian, but I don't hear any vegetarian, is it? No idea? Non-vegetarian? Okay. Yeah, non-vegetarian pests are better for human beings, but we need both of them. Okay? S because we need non-veg because the non-veg pests eat the veg pest. The veg pests actually eat our plants or the leaves or the vegetables, right? The vegetables are there. The veg pests first come and they keep eating our food. So we don't want them. But if we don't want them, we should not spray and kill them. We are ne they are needed for the non-veg pest. Because if I am not feeding them enough, these non-veg also will start eating these vegetables. We need this balance and nature knows how to balance it. For terrace garden people, you may have seen these white, uh, I, I forgot their name suddenly, those white little worms that we find like, uh, what is it called? I forgot suddenly. Okay, those white, white things. The predator of the same is also the same color. So when there is this white worm, we would think this is that bad one, but actually the good ones are also of the same color. That's how the design of nature is. Okay, so both veg and non-veg has to be there in the environment and they will start doing their fights. Our job is to prevent. We're all like mosquito repellents, we have to create pest repellents. Like today the farming, at natural farming, what we create are not pesticides. Pest repellents, which act like a shield, all these Dettol ads that we see, one shield around the human being. So we spray neem oils, we spray, we actually make a kashayam with 10 leaves, okay? So, and have you heard Sultan Ismail sir speak, any of you? Okay, yeah, so com uh, earthworm composting guru. So he puts it very interestingly that farmers, scientists is actually the goat. Goats are actually scientists that every farmer should follow. Okay, and when I say I use these 10 leaves kashayam, I'm bringing up this because goats, what do they eat? Leaves. leaves. But they don't eat all the leaves. They have their preferences. Okay? So if you are going to start a farm, you need some pest repellents to make, just follow a goat. So keep following the goat, it'll go eat every plant and whatever plant it avoids, make a note of it. Okay? So these leaves 
are the ones which act as medicine to put that shield for our plants. And most likely they are of three categories. One, the one which has like a white sap coming out. When you break the leaf, you will find the white liquid seeping out. That's one. Do you remember any plant that comes to your mind? Early, Early yes. Uh, second, the plants which have a very strong smell. So sometimes when you go in the villages, the car will uh, thrash on some plants and you'll have that smell coming. You don't know all these looks like weed. But even like Tulsi, uh, all of these leaves which have the strong smell are also plants that these goats don't like. And third, they don't like plants which are very, very bitter. Okay, this is in Ada Dodaya, I think if you know. So all of these three categories are leaves that plants and every village, where, whatever, wherever you are, the leaves varieties may change, but these three categories will be there. You have to pluck three leaves of the first kind, second kind, third kind, grind them all in a mixy, add some cow urine, boil it, filter it, mix with water and spray. This is a lot of work. That work is what people are not willing to do. It's easier to go to a shop and say, I have this problem, give me this blue bottle, give me this red bottle. And what worked for my neighbor farmer, please give me the same bottle. <laughs> okay? So, we have been trying to bring back what's been working, some of them proven scientifically also, but what works across and what is, slight modifications has to be a, there, and I, that's why I don't follow a particular guru. There are so many people here also saying, I follow this man and I do the same farming. No, no, it may not work. Okay? So, we started watermelons and then for the... Rats, interestingly, people said keep white paper everywhere and the rats won't come, it worked. White paper. <laughs> white paper. Just have white paper randomly in your fields, the rats won't come. It worked. Same for terrace gardens, they, when you have a lot of doves and birds, they said hang a black cloth and a white cloth, the doves didn't come. So all of these may st look strange, but they are also things that work. Or some people said just put a bowl of water and the plant, the birds will just have the water and they leave because their birds love to dig the tender leaves and drink the water from the tender part. Okay, so different ways to just tackle the general problems we have, but chemicals is not the solution. That's the easiest solution. Next, so this is natural farming. So we have used a lot of the native cows. <coughs> so cow urine is the best, best, best repellent ingredient. And cows, uh, cow dung is the best manure that we can actually find. If you go to the US, people talk horse manure and uh, pig manure. So a lot of these manures, all these animals are uh, very nature designed good machines. So if you give them a lot of food this side, in the back side you'll get the manure. You don't have to invest in big machines. Just feed them this side, they'll give you in the back. <laughs> okay, so all of these are interesting when I quit job here and went and did farming and uh, learned this from the local people. Uh, but what really is the real knowledge is, we today, people tell me, did you do a soil test? Did you look at the weather report? Did you do all of that? Too much of planning also is like people already know. Different lands is different type. Soil test also, if I'm going to test it from my soil, one acre itself has three, four types of soil, <laughs> right? So I need to just go to the old man there and ask if it rains, where does the water stagnate? So all these practical, it's like I'm, people are advising me and teaching me how to interview people for jobs. Similarly, if you are going to do farming or grow your own food, you should just go ask people where, where will the water stand if it rain if it rains how long does it take to seep down and another fact here so uh, I was doing this uh, we started a farm in Thind Dindivanam okay but there was a second farm and uh, they were doing paddy I I never had this experience of paddy because we were doing greens vegetables and watermelons so the first time we went this the so paddy you know water has to stagnate. Water should always be there. So this guy was spraying something and he told me, Nakapuchi, Varakodade, Nakapuchi. I like, what? Everybody understood around me except me. And then when I understood it, he was actually putting chemicals to avoid earthworms from coming in a paddy field. And for me, it was like more oxymoron. I thought earthworms are good for the farmer, and this guy is saying for earthworms, I'm doing this. Can you all tell me why? I gave you all the clues when I was talking for the last one minute. <laughs> <laughs> the soil. Yeah. The yeah. So earthworms, if they are there, they're going to keep digging and this water will go down. So this farmer has to keep spending more water, more work to avoid that. It's every time they grow paddy, the primary 
chemical introduced this to kill the earthworms there. And I'm here telling people my soil health has improved because if you dig, you'll find earthworms in my land. Okay, so that's how contrary today the world is going to. And we started doing all of this. Uh, we understood that vegetables growing is even more difficult because the perishability is there. Today all our vegetables are harvested the previous evening or today morning and delivered the same day. Okay, so if you're an Adia and you're getting vegetables on Tuesday, my greens are getting harvested morning 7.30, 8 o'clock at Tiruvallur. But carrots would be harvested the previous evening at OT. So straight from there till here and none of us have invested on cold storage, we're not that rich yet. So we have not put cold storage, it comes and you know vegetables definitely can stay fresh for one or two days naturally. And sometimes organic vegetables do have a better shelf life than these vegetables, but not all, and it's not the case all the time also. So for us, today we, uh, we bring them all in the morning and the same day we are delivering them. We tell the families to use them in the rate of uh, what gets spoiled first and all of that. So there's a small change in consumption that, that has been bought. We didn't start a shop. We thought at least we should be scalable, so we are like an online platform. But the idea is, when we have calls of people after seeing our video or something they call, they'll ask me, where's your farm? Can I visit your farm? And we encourage people to visit. Because organic, again, just the label can't help. I can pay money today and get the certificate and I can also claim that I'm organic. And every batch we can't keep putting a CCTV camera and checking whether they have used and follow it. I can't do it. I, if I am exporting and all this, I have to follow these rules, but I'm just saying, that cannot be the only solution because all of these farmers' practices, if we can change them and make it a regular habit, it is just the way they do farming. They don't have other efforts. So if they are greedy about money, yes, they have to do it. So the farmer, our families visit the farms and they meet the farmer. That's one. And for farmers, like the Sun TV, for the first time ever in the life, a farmer gets to know who is the end consumer eating their produce. Right, so they come and tell you that this mirchi was very, this uh, uh, green chili was very, very hot. I like this. And people tell me, tell them that your tomato, the desi tomato is very tasty. I just used to, if I buy it from the shop, I used. So all these conversations where the consumer meets the farmer, that's very interesting. And actually they feel more responsible also. For the farmer, I think there's never been very, very, uh, I think we always say a lot of the jobs are very, and um, people don't thank them enough. So we are trying to see that there's recognition for the farmers who are toiling behind. And I'm happy that we're able to have such conversations through my harvest farms. And if you can read those four words, that's how we believe in the food that we bring to you. Unavu, uravu, uravu, and unarvu. It's all about food and the people. So we have built everything around this concept at my harvest farms. So if we ask, you ask, we will still charge you and only give you not like the saints to <laughs> just grow and deliver. But the organization believes in certain principles and we go by this. So sustainability again, uh, in the way the food is produced, I thought that a lot of it is not waste. Okay, today the global data is 40% of the food produced by a farmer doesn't reach the consumer. Why? Okay, perished. It's perished. What else? Discarded, yeah. Why? Not fresh, not usable. Anything else? Not visually appealing. Yeah, not visually appealing also. Uh, what else? Logistics. Logistics. So a lot of problems which are really a real problem also. So when I pull a carrot from the soil, the tip of it will be broken. 97% of the carrot is still usable. But 3% is broken. But if I deliver it to you, will you be happy? Some of you are yes, saying yes, but I think most of people today will not say yes. Okay. So that's one. Again, I have a papaya. I know this papaya took eight months to grow and it's very tasty. But while moving it out of the crate, it just touched the border and there's one line. And it's cut. Now I can't deliver that papaya. If it was a shop, you will discard it. Because I'm delivering, sometimes I can tell you and then... So uh, some of the reasons are logistics. Some of the reasons are naturally it's perishable. Because the broccoli, for example, whenever it's in season, I get it from my OT farmer. There it is so fresh. For me in the morning it is fresh. But when I deliver it is already opened. The flowers are bloomed. It's yellow. It is still edible. 100% edible. But you Google, it will say it is poisonous. Yellow flowering is poisonous. Cauliflower, it is white there. 
it comes to me slightish gray color when it reaches you it doesn't look good right so some challenges are with consumerism like i was saying before but i think all these foods grapes is the most contaminated i think you can go read about it for yourself some uh, the fao has given a list of red foods foods that we should avoid or high risk foods grapes is always there in the top 3 1 2 or 3 is always there another fruit that you think is also always there in the list any other fruit grapes and then anything else that comes to your mind apple. Uh, apple is also there but apple is usually the waxing part of it so people can even do a lot of the other stuff peel the skin and eat anything else? strawberry and i go to any school and i ask girls and boys want to grow strawberry blueberry and strawberry is the new craze <laughs> but strawberry i tell you i went to uti and i met a farmers and was telling you are sending me very little i have so many people wanting strawberry and they said entire uti you won't find so many farmers doing natural growing of strawberries because it is difficult and why because he showed us it's a very tiny plant right so from the flower till it becomes the red fruit it is actually how many days any idea from that white flower till it becomes that white fruit and then becomes that red strawberry any idea how many days it might take i want to be turning you into farmers more than food 18 days okay so in those 18 days he tells me minimum 15 days they have to spray and i'm still not telling you what they are spraying okay 15 days they have to spray and more spraying is done after the fruit has formed because it should not decay the honey bees or the other bees or other insects should not eat them and for a lot of other reasons so and this doesn't even have a skin like apple to peel off okay the same case is with the, uh, all the spinach today greens we all know it's the most nutritious thing that we can all have but sadly the life of a uh, greens from seed to harvest is usually how many days again any idea two weeks two weeks any other answer one week no no sadly no <laughs> micro greens today yes but uh, at least 20 25 days is usually okay so in 15 days onwards you can start using them as micro greens but usually 20 25 days so the, the spray is done on the day of the harvest also because if there are holes in the leaves we don't buy we say they are all puchi karchi fight but actually in my experience of growing greens for the last 5 years these are all the play of these butterflies they keep playing and they keep putting their droppings or they just go fidget with the leaves and they make these holes and just go they not even insect attacks and for us half the leaves are discarded because they have these holes so i at one point i started putting videos saying please people don't ignore this is the butterfly's job unless there is a problem with the leaf please don't discard them these are 100% edible and nutritious so there has to be these awareness also that i'm doing as part of what we do so next So this is me and my team. So uh, we today have more than about 200 products, and all of these products, I think some of them uh, we introduced because they were adulterated. So for me, I didn't want to like start an org- online shop. The objective was not that because I had a terrace garden. I first grew what we were doing at our home. So we had greens and only vegetables, and suddenly we thought, why not fruits? Because some farmers had banana and papaya, and then we looked out for some seasonal other fruits. today we have a range of fruits and we have farmers across to bring in that variety uh we have even passion fruits we just la- till last week we had so we are able to bring in that variety and then during the pandemic is when the entire supply chain all the big retailers everybody had these challenges because ours was local supply chain we were operating it was challenging but we were operating up then people started asking can you also give us rice because today it is difficult to find out polished rice and polished rice i want brown rice red rice and now i'm going to ask you another question probably my last question how many varieties of rice do we have in india okay now the highest number we have got is 500 the answer is more than that who wants to say 1460 is more than that shankar sir hi <laughs> okay it's more than 1500 or whatever he was saying I'm going to give you a special prize whoever gives me the right answer closest answer How many varieties are there getting from 
My question is different. How many varieties do you have in India? <laughs> market, leave the market. All of India. Northeast also eats rice, remember. 20,000? 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, no, it's more than that. <laughs> if any of you have internet working on your phones, you can even do a Google, so open book test. 10,000? No, it's still more than that. 20,000? No, it's more than that. That's why I, I, I've given you the freedom to Google it out. <laughs> Another second, and you can, if you want, you can have internet, you can search. 100,000? Uh, is more than that. <laughs> Okay, so Google, and you'll find the answer. It is actually, according to Google or internet re re proper records, till 1970, and this is only India, not, not Indonesia. They also eat rice. Okay, only in India. Until 1970, we had 1,10,000 varieties of rice documented. And what was able to be found was 6,000 varieties. Then we lost them all. Today, there are different people saving these varieties of seeds and all of that. And there's Nelja Raman and there's so many Vandana people. Shiva. Vandana Shiva doing her own revolution of seed saving. We have Debal uh, in uh, Orissa doing. So there are so many people trying to preserve and bring back these seeds. But sadly, I get pissed off when people say, rice is carbs. I won't eat it. Okay. Actually, there was rice for every, dif uh, in a household, it is recommended we have different varieties of rice. Okay, so rice is usually only three, ca three categories, white rice, red rice, and black rice. There's nothing actually called brown rice. That's a na natural color if you dehusk. Okay, there's nothing called brown rice. The red rice slightly gone off. So the polished, unpolished is all there. But a lot of these rice, again, every 15 kilometer had a variety of rice. For Tanjavur being the rice bowl of India, it had more than 300 varieties. There was a rice called uh, Mapala Samba. You know that. For stamina and that all this comedy movies lifting that stone, you needed to eat maple samba rice if you have to lift that stone and marry the bride. Okay, so there was rice growing for eight feet, which can even hide an elephant going behind. It's called katiyanam. Okay, so rice, every rice had a story. And today I tell people, please eat rice. Moderation, I, I tell, tell you moderation, but don't say no to rice. There are rice which are good for people lactating, moms. Pungar is a rice which is very good for women's health, which nutrition you can't find anywhere else. So a lot of these micro nutrition is available in rice itself, but again, local rice, native rice. And for the farmers, it's good because it is native. It doesn't take a lot of water. It can adapt to the climate changes. Just like how we're talking about millets today, rice had its own history. Okay. So we today have, like I've been, I know people doing more than like 60, 80 varieties, but I have only six varieties on my harvest farm so that the change is easier. Because sometimes traditional rices need more time to soak and then cook. Sometimes it's a little problem. So we said, all these rice which can quickly change, I have it. And if you don't have the patience, we have them as a dosa mix or we have them as a putu mix, like that. So we're trying to do value added and enable more women to grow and make better products with that. So that's, I started with only greens. The idea is evolving, evolving, and today it's going more deeper. So the entire team of us. What exactly do you do there in the farm? Uh, all farmers do their own crops, so five or six varieties. So there's a group of farmers growing. So one of my farms, my family, we have a sort of people growing there. So I used to live in the farm three years before. During COVID, I came back and I started doing the operations here. So farmers are doing their growing throughout the year, and farmers today get paid at least eight to nine months. So eight to nine months, the farm, farm is active. During heavy rains in November, December, sometimes we are not able to do much growing, and also May, we don't plant new things. Otherwise, around the year, there is some crop or the other in the farm, which is happening. So we, de we work with them uh, two days before I ask them what is going to be harvested. Okay, so a farmer Ramesh tell me, I'll, I can give you 20 kgs of brinjal, I can give you so much bunches of greens and all of this. So we aggregate all of that and then we let our families know that this is what is available for coming week. And there is a pre-order that happens. So Ram Kumar sir will now order so many, so many kgs and he'll place his order. The farmer is updated and everything comes to me that morning and then we grade and pack. So we have a team behind which does the working with the farmer on the field bringing them to the pack house that we have here till the last mile delivery. 
So end to end, because just selling to the organic shop again, you're going to ask the same question, is it organic? And there were not enough shops to sell what we can actually produce. So it's again a limitation. Is profitable? profitable for the farmer or for the company? I'll answer both. <laughs> for the farmer, uh, actually, first two, three years is definitely investment in improving the soil health. If I'm starting now, right? First, uh, we have to spend a lot on bringing back the soils, uh, nature to absorb the things that we give, give to it, after which my cost of inputs will come down. Uh, okay, so most till today, the labor is actually free. Farming, there, nobody puts a cost to the farming labor. So if I'm going to employ people in my farm, then there is a labor cost which will bite up the margins, whatever is there for the farmer. But if a farmer grows on his or her land, makes their own farm inputs, definitely the margins are getting wider. And we see our farmers are today profitable. The farmers who have been with us for more than two, three years, uh, like a farmer, Ramesh, uh, who does watermelons, he actually sometimes was making 60,000 a month by only watermelons and ladies figure, just two crops, two crops, that three months. But the other months, he will still have, today he has bitter god, he has rich god, he has again three bunches of uh, varieties of greens, so something or the other on a month, I'm looking at providing them 18k to 20k a month. Their expenses will be 3,000 rupees. And this money is coming like a weekly, different parts and parts of it. It's not like a monthly salary I'm paying them. So it's fluid money that they're able to mash. There's a cash flow for my farmer today, simple. We don't have orchards, but mangoes and few other things, we have farmers doing it like an, the entire farm is only mango. But otherwise, most of them have a mix of, it's like an agroforest, food forest, right? So it's difficult for me to just go to a farmer and say, do permaculture. They, will, they need to be financially viable for them. So we work with them to understand what is really possible. And then if that 40% loss that I told you, if we can value add, like the same mangoes which had damage here and there, if 20% can become pickles, why not? So I have beetroot malt today, and my beetroot farmer is happy. Another women group is happy. Customers are also happy. Hema white, right? So we're trying to work into the entire supply chain and make sure food is safely grown. So there's better production, there is better nutrition, and there's better livelihood for everybody in the world. Coming to today's topic, what, what we need, a lot of people are waiting here to listen to you, for what should be eaten and what Fresh, local, and seasonal. So uh, I can't be telling, for your for diabetes, eat this. This is again a nutritionist job. I'm, no, I'm just saying the rainbow on your plate is definitely what I'm also, I will also be talking about. The rainbow colors, every plate, if you just eat it, curry rice and say, am I, my, how, my plate is full or my stomach is full. That's not the nutrition we need to give our body, right? So different colors, that's why sambar is good, simple. Sambar is good because it has different colors of vegetables inside it and every color has a nutrition attached to it. For me, today, the, it's not about the quantity we eat. Gut health is something which is also not talked about much, okay? So today, Drinking water, we talk about it. Gut health, we don't talk. So there are some foods which we definitely need to keep our digestive system and the intestines healthy. We keep dumping a lot of food at different times, time frames and all that. So I don't want to sound like a nutritionist. I'll answer questions that you have about food and then we can uh, close the conversation. So that's it. That's it. Uh, so the three months that I said is actually the fallow time today. So when they're not able to, no, no, the May time or when people still doing paddy, they have this fallow period because they generally do sesame or they do groundnuts. After paddy, they still do go for the next crop, but they will leave the base of the paddy to still there, be there for some time. They don't then burn it off. So there is this fallow time, but time duration obviously has come down. Uh, different crop rotation is helping us. So mulching is something we use to all these uh, paddy hay for. Okay, good question. Thanks. Uh, I thought I shouldn't ask more questions, but he's making me ask. What is the percentage of nitrogen in the air? We all breathe in oxygen, give out carbon dioxide, all of that. But what is the percentage of nitrogen in the air? You studied in your books? <laughs> Putting you in a spot. <laughs> 78, correct. Then why do we again have to give so much? There's 78 percentage of nitrogen in the air. So much in the air. Then why do we need a urea which has nitrogen and give it to the soil? 
that's another mistake which happened during the green revolution and different theories okay so actually at our farms and generally not just my harvest every farmer usually will have a lot of leguminous plants pulses usually before crop paladhanyam na tamil la solluvom usually we have a lot of these leguminous and oil oil seed plants which are grown and even today now if you go and pull a castor plant you can see the root will have these nodes these nodes are all nitrogen from the air absorbed by the plant and fixed to the soil naturally there is a process happening to fix nitrogen in the soil the soil needs n p and k n is there plenty in the air p and k i think the cow urine the goat urine cow dung goat dung throw it at home if you have a terrace garden you can put banana peels banana peels has a lot of potassium right our vegetable peels have a lot of this p and k i think everything is already there somewhere we have to bring it to the right place and get it to the soil so our focus today is not yield 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 will come we do focus and measure it but it is about the soils carbon and the npk that we are talking about so uh, actually diabetic uh, is di- diabetic is a disease or a deficiency deficiency i have friends in early 20s also having diabetes today so today is become like everybody having this deficiency just like he- anemia so it's about an hormone uh, secretion which is becoming a problem inside the body that's it so we shouldn't give a lot of work to that pers- that hormone job so f- lots of fiber in the food and when i take about ra- portioning the food is good enough so you have to the it can't work to 100% efficiency but the same system can work for 70% efficiency so you are letting your food come in different paths so that it can operate at that 70% efficiency so portioning your food having a lot of these uh, rice wise white rice is good only go for because all of these natural ri- traditional rices have gl- low glycemic index i'm still talking science naturally they have very sm- uh, less gi so select some rice have a mix of millets all of these because if you eat less that is a useful filling filling to us that portioning is indirectly done when you have all of this and vegetables just avoid things which can quickly add into the blood and let the blood become doing a lot of work sweet potato is good anything sweet is bad is what we think but sweet potato is very good for diabetes so there are some foods which help and aid our system for our gut health and the uh, secretion of insulin hormone so avoid white sugar is for everybody not just diabetic but avoid all of these but include more of fiber include more of vegetables uh, say yes to millets and these traditional rice varieties in moderation because uh, fruits if all of us are eating i think we should be eating the fruit we should not be drinking a fruit juice fruit juice just breaks the fiber plus you will have an urge to add sugar to it whatever be even if it is brown sugar still is sugar only from the same sugar cane sulfur is not there that's the difference right for a body you still ha- understand it as sugar so i would say eat a fruit eat water so all of these uh, breaking food properly in the mouth because i eat very slowly i definitely chew so my husband doesn't chew enough so i'm saying chew your food <laughs> that also puts less pressure on the body to act on your food wheat and chapati again is again like too much of the commercializing that has come okay so wheat we do have wheat here in south india but eat again is because fiber if you have anything else vegetables having fiber you can just replace it so wheat is because rice is having lesser fiber than wheat so eating wheat helps but don't again eat too much of wheat again that is also too much of pressure on the body so chapati is is definitely good but because chapati is are good don't eat chapati moderation any other question you have any support from the government for your great uh, initiative so for this today the current government has introduced the organic farming policy and we have people from our forum who are who have been instrumental there uh there was one time when the government incentivized farmers doing natural farming they paid them some but i think it was not implemented for a longer time two months i think they got but after which it was not there uh, i think there is lot more work to be happen ha- to be done because it's still in the nascent stages my farmer sitting in an abar meeting is still not making sense 
No, my question uh, is to follow the important point. My name is Stan, this uh, organic formula. You know, they have the peer group pressures. And that is a very difficult address in a local village scenario. No, that is always there, but today what... No, we're not big enough to get too much, too much of pressure yet, but the fact is what works peop, like everywhere, if one, one of them is successful, everybody follows, right? So for me, the challenge was to create that one farmer champion there. So first we were doing, people thought we have, we were rich, we had no other job, somebody was funding us, we were doing farming. They even asked, I have, do you, who is funding you? My name has Stalin, nothing to do with the government. <laughs> His father named him, <laughs> that's all, okay? So uh, we had to create that farmer champion of somebody who was, like when the first farm happened, we had three farmers from our team doing work and we had people coming in cars on weekends meeting them and every time there was a car, the whole village will be suspecting us. But when the conversations with the people happened, we would take them, to, so I don't have like a farm house and doing a farm visit. I take them to every part of the village. There is a pump set, there is water, there is sunflower and I take them to the entire village. So when they see people accepting that the recognition I was talking about earlier, they, s they start seeing, is it viable? So now, doable is the first question. Is it working? My farmer, like, they have a farmer, Tata, who is the oldest man, Uruvaya in my team. Uh, when he joined us, he actually was a shepherd. For 30 years almost, he was uh, rearing goats. And these people are the ones who are like messengers in any village. They will know every story in every house, who comes, who goes, and all of that. For this Tata, we employed him because he was working as a security elsewhere and didn't, I lost job. Here, he wouldn't touch the cow dung. And when, I ask, when we asked him to make this uh, ginger turmeric paste, he like, sir, this not, won't work. I'll put this bottle, it'll work. We had to do work to make him not do anything else other than what we say. But when we took him to another farm in Tirichi, happy hens, if you know. The so when we took him there, and the, though there they were telling, we give turmeric to my hens, we give them uh, garlic, we give them all of this. He's like, yeah, even I do this, that works. This, that. You have to put the asafoetida, you have to put this. And he was like the expert in natural farming. First, they have to, they lost faith in the system, ma'am. So if the government just tells them this is good and working and you can all keep doing it, that itself is a big boost today. So that is one, the awareness of production. The training systems today is like subsidized urea, subsidized this, I'll give you incentives for this. And it's already plenty. I would still say if people don't want to, they can refrain. But because my plants are not yielding, somebody used it, it's yielding. Okay, let me also follow. So it's a follow herd mechanism that's happening. But government definitely has good schemes where they incentivize people to do these climber uh, terrace, uh, climbers set up. But like any system today, getting it, people are able to get loans. When they have a marriage in the family, they would do an agricultural loan, get that money and get one marriage done. So I think there is a lot of holes in the system which can be fixed and today they are more receptive and uh, there is a committee getting formed for natural farming and chemical free food. Welcoming. Because now, the last two weeks when I went back, a lot of my farmers were telling me that to transit into organic farming, you need to wait three years for the yeah, yeah. and then fifth year is when you are recognized. Yeah, actually, uh, three years is the general period that for large farmers probably, yes. For small farmers, I can't tell any of them to not fa do farming for three years. What we have realized is there is a methodology to let the land behave the way we want in six to eight months. The methodology is again same as leguminous plants, do this, do that, where the soil gets toppled up. So there is a very uh, adamant child. You adopt the child and you bring it home and you the environment, the exposure and all of this changes the child to start accepting the goodness around it, right? Similar method. So here, when you start giving it good things, it takes its own time to start understanding and adapting to the different farm inputs we are going to give. Because other than that, everything else is mostly external. What the soil has, to, we have to prepare the soil to start. It's I usually reclaiming of the land. I can't say 0% chemical in the land before I, it's never going to happen because if it rains, water is going to run off from the neighbor village. So we work on the land to make it ready to absorb the nutrition that we can give thereafter. So that's why I'm not saying I'm certified. I'm not claiming it to my consumers also. Welcome, Amanda. So on behalf of, of all our brothers and sisters assembled here, on behalf of the Theosophical Society, I thank Sister Archana, 
Stalin and her husband for the good and the noblest work that they are doing. She mentioned that she is a learner. No, she is an action heroine. Whatever we have learned, we must put into action. And that is the thing that she is doing. And uh, Archana, you know that service is a great illuminator. So you are doing enormous service to the earth and to the farmers. So we know that greatest of all the virtue is gratitude. <laughs> That's what the scriptures and also religious teaching says. We must show, of course, gratitude to our friends, our parents first, next to our teachers, guru, our relations, wife and children, and next to friends and kinsmen, and of course to the holy ones. But they say you must show the utmost gratitude to our servants and dependents as the earth beneath which humbly nourishes all. So there are many people indirectly doing service to us, like servants, gardeners, and farmers. So we tend to forget the benefit obtained from the service of these humble people and who are compared to earth in Sanskrit. So we actually, we tread upon it, use it, and it sustains us and nourishes us with food and enable us to continue our existence. Farmers are doing this humble and they co contribute to our welfare also. So only we call it Udave Talai, our Udavatkum Todilkum Vandanai Chaivo. So there is a kural that is a couplet written by Thiruvalluvar in the book Thirukural and it says, Uldundu Valvare Valvar Matellam Toldundu Pinchel Bavar. So who are involved in agricultural work are the ones who live, the others only follow them. They subsist on their toil. So and uh, we also must realize that God can be found not only in the shrines, church, temple, but also wherever the men at work. So just as a man through his religion finds a road to God to reach the highest, so can he find another road to God through his daily activities, provided he identifies himself with an idealism which can be found in his work. So, Sister Archana, you are doing that. And the most important teaching we should be taken into heart is that, that a man's profession or means of livelihood is one door to his highest spiritual realization. And that as he does his work loyally, faithfully, with dedication. So, uh, Showing our gratitude is a wonderful thing because it changes the quality of one's heart and mind, for it characterizes the state of wisdom. So we really appreciate your great work. You have to learn, you have to act and reach the goal. Okay? Not learn and earn, but learn, act and reach the goal. And our best wishes for your success, for your future endeavor, be united and do this service. Thank you. So, I now request our general manager, Brother Jai Kumar, to place this books, these optical books, in appreciation of the Thank you. Thank you.